you have your Bibles, you could turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Now, how many have ever read the book of Chronicles? You didn't even know there was a first Chronicles. But 2 Chronicles chapter 2, I mean, uh, chapter 26. And we're going to go through that whole passage, and we're going to study the life of Uzziah, because Uzziah started serving the Lord, and he did great things. But then he fell apart because he allowed pride to get into his heart. Now, his father as well, Amaziah, did great things for the Lord, but he also had a bad ending because he turned away from the Lord. So his father and grandfather and him started off right serving the Lord. But as they got older, they turned away from the Lord because they allowed the blessings of God to replace God himself. And for some reason, they thought that everything they accomplished, it was because of their own self-effort, because they were good enough. So the key text in this whole passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, how many are there? Some are still having a hard time sifting through the pages. 2 Chronicles chapter 26, the key verse is verse 5. Listen to verse 5. Uzziah sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. And this is right here, the theme of the whole message. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. So there is a condition if we want to be successful. As long as he served the Lord, God gave him success. So what does success mean? Does it mean that you have a big house, or you drive a, a nice car, or you make a lot of money? That is success in the world. But what is biblical success? Biblical success is that you are fulfilling the core and the plan of God in your life. How many know that all of us, God created us in his image and in his likeness. He designed us. He has a purpose and a plan for each one of us. So biblical success is you walking in the will of God, in the plan of God, because you can have all these other external things, but if you miss the plan of God in your life, you fail. God told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, do not let the book of the law or my word depart from your mouth. Meditate upon it day and night, and then you shall be prosperous, and then you're going to be successful. Successful in what, Joshua? Successful in bringing the children into the promised land and conquering the enemy. So Joshua's success was dependent upon his obedience to the word of God. Success is you fulfilling the call of God upon your life, walking in God's ways, following his will. In Acts chapter 20, Paul said this, however, I don't count my life as worth anything to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said, I don't care about my life as long as I finish the assignment that God has given me to do. And you know that Paul got beheaded in Rome. Now, was his life successful? Absolutely in God's eyes. So first thing we need to do is define success based upon the Bible, not in the world with money and cars and motorcycles and all these different external things that people look for for success. But if you don't fulfill the call of God, if you don't follow God's plan, you will be saved, but you won't be satisfied. Jesus, when they came to him and brought him food, he said this, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In other words, he was saying, my greatest satisfaction is doing the will of my father. How many know that that brings extreme contentment? You don't need anything else when you know you're walking in the will, in the plan, and the desire of God. Jesus said this when he was praying in John chapter 17. Father, I brought you glory on the earth. How? By completing the assignment you've given me to do. We all have an assignment. We all have a, a calling. We all have a plan that God has designed for us. But the opposite is that Satan also has a plan for your life. To destroy you, to destroy your marriage, to destroy your kids, to get you away from God, to get caught up with the things of the world, to get distracted. God has a plan for your life. And Satan says, I also have a plan for your life. 
And you decide which plan you're going to follow. And for all of us who've been saved for many, many years, we've seen those who follow the plan of the devil. It always leads to destruction. It might bring a temporary satisfaction, but you know, it always leads to destruction. So this is what happened in Uzziah's life. Uzziah, his early years, we're going to study his early years, his righteousness and achievements. And he was rewarded by God because God, he saw God. So we're going to see the first part of his life. It's not how you start, it's always how you what? Finish. Verse 1, then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father, Amaziah. Uzziah recaptured and rebuilt Elam, an important seaport at the eastern tip of the Red Sea. So he was the one who rebuilt Elam and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his fathers. Now, decades earlier, it had been conquered by Solomon, but it was lost during the reign of Jehoram. Now, Elam is once again brought under the control of Judah, which gave the nation an important seaport for commerce and economic growth. So he restored this city to Israel, I mean to Judah, because at this time the kingdom was divided. For those who don't know the Old Testament, let me explain to you what happened. The first king was Saul, God rejected him, and he raised up David, a man after his own heart, and then after that his son Solomon was the third king. And God gave Solomon wisdom and knowledge and understanding. But as Solomon grew old, because he married so many women, that he allowed his heart to be led astray and serve other gods. And as Solomon did that, what happened was God stripped the kingdom away from him. So in 931 before Christ, before Christ, Solomon died. And after Solomon died, his son became king. And his son asked the older guys who were his father, what should I do with the people? How should I lead them? And the older people said, look, if you ease up on the taxes, the people will serve you faithfully. And he said, okay, that's good advice. Let me ask the young men who grew up with me, who was raised with me. Let me see what they think. Young men, what do you think? Should we raise up taxes and make it harder? You know what? You need to tell the people that Solomon was hard, but you're going to be harder on them. And he listened to the advice of the young people, and the kingdom was split. So now Israel is 10 tribes in the north and the capital Samaria, and then Judah and Benjamin is in the south. And the capital is Jerusalem. The kingdom, kingdom was split. So when you read and you see that Israel and Judah fighting, you might say, wait a minute, aren't they the same tribe? Yes, but it became divided. So now here, Azariah is the king of Judah, different from the, 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 the northern kingdom. So he starts conquering these things, and, and he, God begins to use them. Uzziah was a young man when he became the leader of Judah. Verse 3, Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jechariah. She was from Jerusalem. So it doesn't matter how young you are, God can still use you. Some people wait until they're 30 or 40, and sin has ravaged their lives. And now they have to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to unpack all these things and, and struggle with the same issues over and over again. Serve the Lord now while you are young. Give your life to the Lord. Let me tell you, after serving the Lord for 30 years, there's nothing out there that Satan can offer you that's going to bring permanent satisfaction. There's nothing out there. Everything looks good externally, but inside is poison. Don't fall for the devil's trap. So he was 16 years old. A young man, they made him king. And then we see about Uzziah's life. He had a strong spiritual life, living righteously and pleasing the Lord. Verse 4, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. And like I said, Amaziah did start off right. He served God, but at the end of his life, he turned to idols. And because of his pride, he fought with the king of Israel. And the king of Israel told him, look, just because you defeated Edom, that doesn't mean you're going to defeat me, but he still wanted to fight him. He said, look, don't allow your pride and your arrogance to cause you to fall and everybody with you. His father, Messiah, said, I still want to fight. Israel came down, defeated him, and took him captive to Samaria. And we're going to see how the son follows in that same footsteps of pride. I mean, sometimes we transfer our sins to our children. 
And they struggle with the same things that we struggle with because we were not man and woman enough to say, God, deal with this out of my life. Break this sin from my life so that it won't have to be transferred to my children or my children's children. So he had a strong spiritual life. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He was walking with God. Early in his life, he was placed under the care of a man named Zechariah who instructed him in the visions of God or the fear of the Lord. Verse 5 says that. He saw God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of the Lord. Now, he was only 16 years old, so he needed mentorship. Someone older to teach him the word of God, to teach him the law of God, to teach him what it is to be king. And this man, Zechariah, poured into him the word of God, taught him, discipled him, trained him. So he was not alone. A 16-year-old cannot govern a whole nation. God had placed people in his life to mentor him, to disciple, to bring him along. And that's the best thing anybody can do if you're a young person. Get under them and, and learn the word of God. Be mentored, be discipled. Even if you're older, if you've never been discipled, you need to be discipled under the word of God. So he had great training. This means that he was instructed in the word of God, taught the commandments of God, as well as the duties of a king. So, so far he's doing good. How many agree? He's the king, 16 years old. He's a leader. God places a man named Zechariah, older than him, that's teaching him the word of God, that's coaching him. He's pleasing. He's doing things that are pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. He's walking with God. He's doing great. Verse 5, he sought God during the days of Zechariah. That's the one who instructed him in the fear of God. So he was doing right. He sought God. He was looking for God, which means he had a prayer life. Seeking God means that you, you have a relationship with God. You're going after God. You want to know, Lord, is this your will? Lord, is this not your will? God, should I do this or should I do that? God, should I take this job or take that job? God, I'm seeking you. I'm direction and guidance. He sought the Lord in the days of Zechariah. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. He made him prosper as long as what? He sought the Lord. Once you start putting God second, third, or fourth, is a downhill from there. How many recognize that? As long as he sought the Lord, and for us as a church, as long as we're seeking God, that you in prayer, that you fast, that when we have a prayer meeting and you come out, you're seeking God. You're not allowing the distractions of this world to cause your relationship with God to be distracted. And that's why it is important for those who are in ministry to pray. And to seek God. No one should be in ministry that does not have a prayer life. Because if you don't pray and you don't have a relationship with God, how are you going to help others develop a relationship with God? And throughout the years, we have many people that wanted to be in ministry with great talents and all that. Listen, the church is not America got talent. I mean, you know that. It's not a place where you can showcase your talent and everybody can see you and you can say, look at me, I'm great. I can sing well, I can preach well, I can teach well, I'm a great administrator, I can do this or that. It's not America got talent. The church is the body of Christ where only God gets the glory. As long as he sought the Lord, the Lord caused them to prosper. And to be successful. So if you want to be successful, listen to what, what happened to Azariah. If you want to be successful, which means following the plan of God in your life. Whenever the Satan says, I got this plan, you want to do this, you reject it. I don't want to go that route. When Satan says, why don't you do that? You reject it. You don't want to go that route. You follow the plan of God, which is in the word of God. You follow the Lord and you will be successful and God will bless you and God will cause you to prosper and you will move forward. And sometimes that includes monetary uh, blessings. Sometimes it includes finances, but not all the time. I mean, you know that Paul was broke. He had to go to different churches asking for money and, and be a tent maker. Not everyone can handle money. Money will destroy some people. God knows who to bless financially. Who can handle it? You know, who, who, who is not going to allow money to corrupt their character? So he sought the Lord. And as long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. And I meet a lot of Christians that struggle. And they're wondering, why doesn't God bless them? And they're confused about their calling. And I don't know what God has called me to do. But the first question is, are you seeking God? 
How is your prayer life? Do you pray every single day? Do you talk to your Heavenly Father every single day? And if you do, he will show you what he wants you to do. God does not play hide and seek with his will and says, I hope they can find my will. I'm going to hide it from them and play games. If you're truly every day going into your prayer room and saying, Lord, here I am. Show me what you want me to do, Lord. I'm seeking you, Lord. Give me guidance. Give me direction. I love you more than anything in this world. God, take complete control of my life. God will reveal himself to you in a greater way. Christianity is not for God to do everything that we want him to do. That's not what being a Christian means. That I come to Christ and now God gives me everything I want. It's coming to Christ and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? And sometimes God has to strip us of things we have because we attach our self-esteem and our identity to that. That God has to strip you off of that so that you can only trust in him. Your identity should come from him. Your self-esteem should come from him. Everything, your security should come from him. Not from all these external things that people attach themselves to. To feel good about themselves. So when they don't have those things. They don't feel good about themselves. As long as he sought the Lord. God gave him success. And if you have your Bibles underline it. Just right there I can close. And with that verse. If you live according to that verse. As long as you seek the Lord. God will give you success. It doesn't mean that there will be opposition. But overall. God will look out to you. Because you're putting him first. David said, once I was young, but now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David was never in want. Why? Because the Lord was his shepherd. God was number one in David's life. And that's why he's considered a man after God's own heart. Even though he sinned, committing adultery and murder, but he always came back to God in repentance. You know that when he sinned and God told him, I'm going to take that baby away because of your sin. David laid on the floor for seven days without eating or drinking, fasting, crying out to God, saying, Lord, please spare the baby. We can't even fast one day sometimes. That's the most extreme fast. Laying on the ground for seven days without eating or drinking. Was David desperate? Absolutely. But even his desperation, it did not change God's mind. God said, I'm still taking the baby. There's consequences for our sins. How many know that? God loves us. He cares about us. But when we sin, there's always consequences. Now we're going to know five uh, far-reaching achievements that are given in Scripture. Keep in mind that these achievements were gifts from God. Blessings poured upon Uzziah because he was seeking the Lord. Number one, Uzziah achieved success in war and extending Judah's territory. Verse 6 through 8, it says this. He went to war against the Philistines and broke down the walls of Gath, Jabna, and Ashto. He then rebuilt towns near Ashto and elsewhere among the Philistines. Verse 7, God helped him. Underline that. God helped him. Did Uzziah do that because he was smart and wiser than everybody else? No, it was because why? God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabs who lived in Gerbaal and against the Munites. The Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah and his fame spread as far as the border of Egypt. Listen to this. Because he had become very powerful. Always note that. He's becoming powerful. And what happens when some people get become powerful and God begins to use them and they start accomplishing great things. But I want you to note that God helped him. And a lot of times when we're doing good, it's not because of us. It's because God is helping us. We can't do it on our own. We're sinful by nature. David said, I was conceived in iniquity and in sin I was brought forth. The only reason we can still walk with God and, and work and have a job and make some money is because God is helping us. It's not because of us. God helps us. Number two, Uzziah achieved success in several major construction projects. Verse 9 through 10. Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, 
at the valley gate and at the angle of the war, and he fortified them. Now, Jerusalem was destroyed at this time. Remember, his father went to fight against the king of Israel. The king of Israel came down, destroyed Jerusalem, and took his father captive to Samaria. So now, Azariah has to start rebuilding the city all over again because of his father's pride. But we're going to see that if you don't deal with sin, it keeps passing down from generation to generation. He also built towers in the desert and dug many cisterns. In Jerusalem, he made machines designed for skillful men for use on the towers and on the corner defenses to shoot arrows and hurl large stones. So he built war machines that can shoot arrows and stones and put them on the wall. He was a military man. God gave him the wisdom to do all these things to protect Jerusalem. The next thing we see Uzziah achieved great fame, a fame that spread far and wide, verse 15. But it must be remembered his fame and power was due for the help the Lord was helping him. Verse 15, the last part of verse 15, listen to this. Again, his fame spread far and wide, listen to this, for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. That word until lets us know that there's a ship. God kept helping him until he became powerful because he allowed his power to consume. God would help us, but he was greatly helped until he became powerful. When we think that we can make it on our own strength, that's when we collapse. When we think that everything that we have, our money, our house, our car, all these different things is because we are great and we are special and God needs me and he owes me all these blessings. As soon as we allow our hearts to get inflated with pride, it starts going downhill. He was greatly helped until he became powerful. And now we're going to see Uzziah's latter years, his slide into sin and his fall, his judgment. It says this, but after Uzziah became powerful, again, three times it mentions that word in that whole chapter. So you want to underline it. Whenever the Bible repeats a word, it's because it's emphasizing this is what causes downfall. He allowed his, his heart to become pride. God will give us power. God will raise us up. God will use us. God will bless us. But if we allow our hearts to get prideful, that's when we start going downhill. Verse 16 says this, but after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now, what does that mean? The only ones that were allowed to burn incense were the priests, the Levites. So, as, as the right did not only want to be king, he also wanted to be a priest. He took it upon himself, a calling and, and a, an assignment that was not his. He figured, wait, I'm the king. Nobody can tell me what to do. I'm going to go in the temple and begin to burn incense. When pride gets into our heart, we think that we're God's privileged children. That we can sin and we're not going to get caught. That we can do wrong and God's going to let us slide. That all the consequences of sin apply to everybody else, but I'm slicker than God, and it's not going to apply to me. So he allowed the blessings of God. Everything he's accomplished, his success, as he was seeking the Lord and following after God, living a daily life of prayer and, and worshiping God. He was doing great, but he saw everything that he's accomplished. He says, wait a minute. I'm a king, but I want to be a priest too. And that's when he got into trouble. He wanted to burn incense. And only the, the priests were allowed to burn incense. Because remember, the priests were the intercessors for the children of Israel. They were not allowed to do that. They were supposed to bring incense. They were supposed to represent the people to God and God to the people. They were the mediator for the people. The same way in the New Testament, Christ is the mediator between us. How many know that we can't approach God on our own merit or on our own goodness? We can only approach God. Why? Because Christ is the mediator between God and man. He stands in the gap. He is our intercessor. 
So the same thing as the priests back then, they interceded for the children of Israel, for the people of God. But as Arise said, I want to burn incense and no one's going to stop me. Verse 17, as Arise the priest with 80 other uh, courageous priests of the Lord follow him in. So he's going into the temple with these incense and they follow him in 80 priests. They confronted him and said, it is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. This is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. In other words, this is not your job. You're stepping over your boundaries. I know that you're king. I know that you're powerful. I know that God has used you to restore Jerusalem and to accomplish all these things. But now you're stepping over your boundaries and you're not dealing with us. You're dealing with God. And when you deal with God, it's a different story. This is not for you. There's people that have been set apart just to do this. And God has set them apart. Get out of this place. This is not for you. And remember, these 80 priests could easily compromise and say, you know what? He's the king. Let him burn incense. And then we can ask favors for him. We can tell him, will you allow us to do this or that? But they didn't compromise the word of God. They stood faithful to God's word. And that's how we need to be. Sometimes we need to be confronted. And thank God that these 80 priests saw him and followed him in and said, wait a minute, you're going on dangerous territory as a ride. This is not for you. This is not your place. This is not your anointing. This is not your calling. This is not your assignment. God has made you king. Stay away from this sacred and holy place. This is not for you to do. And the same thing in our lives. We're walking with the Lord and God places people around us to help us when we derail. How many times does sometimes we derail and God places people around us to tell us you're going the wrong path. You need to break up with that boyfriend or girlfriend. This is not good. It's going to end in destruction. And what do we do? Many times we reject the voice of God through people. Because people are waiting for the voice of God from heaven. But God speaks through people if it's according to the word of God. But we don't want to hear that. We want to hear an angel appear to us and tell us, break up with him or break up with her. Or leave this job or that job. God speaks through his people through the word. But we don't listen. When we get confronted, we get mad and upset because they're telling us the truth. And the truth hurts many times. So they follow Zechariah, Azariah in. Don't do this. Leave the sanctuary. For you have been unfaithful. Again, that same word. He's being unfaithful to the Lord. By doing what he's not supposed to do. By not obeying the word of God. And then they go on to tell him. They're preaching to him basically. And you will not be honored by the Lord God. In other words, God is not going to honor you. God is not going to bless you. In his mind, I'm a king. I'm also going to be priest, and God's going to be pleased with me. But he ignored the voice of God through the priest, trying to help him out. How many know that God puts people in our past to try to help us out? He doesn't leave us alone when we're derailing or when we're doing stuff that we shouldn't be doing. God places people to help us out. And to speak the word of God, to speak sense into our lives. Because sometimes we're blinded by lust or by greed or by money or by positions or by power. We're blinded. Everybody sees it, but we don't see it. And God places people to help you out, to confront you when you're doing something wrong. Of course, in love and in compassion and telling you, look, you're heading towards a brick wall. Jump off that train before it crashes and you think it's not going to happen to me. I'm different. I know how to maneuver. I know how to manipulate. I'm special in the eyes of God. And when you start having that attitude, it always leads to destruction. As Uriah did not listen and listen to what follows. 19. Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand, ready to burn incense. He's still wanting to burn incense. While he was raging, wait, wanted to burn incense, he became what? Angry. And while he was raging at the priest in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. Now we have a problem. Because God intervenes in his holy things. 
Azariah was not dealing with the priest. He was dealing with God. All sin is against God. Even though it might affect people, it's always against God. And that's why Joseph, when Potiphar's wife was telling him to sleep with me day in and day out, she told him, look, the, your master, your husband, has not kept anything from me. He's given me anything except you because you're his wife. How can I do this great sin against God? He had a God conscience. Every sin is against God. He thought he was dealing with the priest. He's messing with the things of God. God is love, but also God disciplines those he loves. How I many you know that? When we get out of line, God disciplines us. Hebrews chapter 13, those he loves, he disciplines us. He corrects us so that we can learn, so that we can grow. So here he's still with the incense in his hands, about to burn it, and leprosy breaks out on his forehead. Verse 20, when Azariah, when Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead. So they hurried him out. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. Now, this does not mean that if we're disobedient to the word of God, we're going to have leprosy. The principle is that if we're disobedient to the word of God, there will be consequences, and God determines those consequences. See, we're free to choose whatever we want to do, but we're not free to choose the consequences of that sin. But everyone's free to do whatever they want, but they're not free from the consequences of sin. There's always consequences of sin, and it's always negative. It's never, you know, positive. It's never somebody singing and say, I feel great. You know, God is blessing me. It's always detrimental to their spiritual life and those around them. So here he breaks out with leprosy. The priest is still trying to help him and trying to get him out of the temple before something else breaks out. In their mercy, out of their love for the priest, for Azariah, you got to get out of this place. This is not for you. This is not your anointing. This is not your calling. God did not assign you to do this. God judges him with leprosy. And verse 21, King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous, leprous and excluded from the temple of the Lord. In other words, if you had leprosy, you had to live in isolation by yourself. How can a man allow himself to get to this place with leprosy? That he couldn't be around people, live in an isolated place until the day of his death because of his disobedience. A man who got used to do great things. That as long as he sought the Lord, God made him successful. As soon as he stopped seeking the Lord, pride got into his heart and it led to his downfall and his destruction. What does that teach us, church? We need to continually seek the Lord because we all can have a tendency to become prideful. How many know that? That we all have what is called indwelling sin. And if we allow uh, that indwelling sin to begin to grow by not praying, by not being in the word, by not fasting and seeking God, all of a sudden we can end up back where we were before. No one is exempt from this. This can happen to anybody. No one is special in the eyes of God in the sense that I don't need to pray, I don't need to see God, and I'm good. With that attitude, you're going to see how your sinful nature is going to overtake you, and then you're going to start causing division, gossiping, arguing, backbiting. Sin begins to rise up. You start using foul language, and before you know it, you realize, man, I've gotten so far from God. But the question is, guess who moved? Not God. He's still there. You stop seeking God. You stop praying. You stop reading the Bible. You stop communing with the he your Heavenly Father. Too much distractions. Too many things to do. I got to wash clothes. I got to go food shopping. I got to clean the house. I got to go to work. And all those things are great. But if it's robbing you from your relationship with God, something needs to be cut off. You have to guard your prayer life with everything in the world because when you pray, that's where you receive power from God. That's where you receive strength. That's where you receive a fresh anointing by the spirit of the living God because Satan knows that without the power of God, you will become exhausted mentally, physically, emotionally in every area of your life. And some at the brink of having a nervous breakdown because they're not seeking God in the prayer closet. 
Why so many Christians fall away saying there's a mastermind and keeping them from that prayer room? Because he knows that in the prayer room there's power. In that prayer room, talking to the Heavenly Father, God every day pours out his spirit and encourages you. He right. strengthens you. Right. He does all these things. So he says, you know what? I got to keep these Christians away from the prayer room. I keep them busy doing, you know, religious things or going to church and all these different things. But if you're not praying and seeking God, you start declining immediately. Jesus said this in John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can't do nothing. How many things we could do? Nothing. nothing. It doesn't mean that you can't have a job or this and that. What he's talking about is you can't accomplish Things that have eternal consequences and eternal value without him. Things that are going to last. Things that are going to outlive you. The people that you lead to Christ. The people that you encourage. That when you pass away, they can look at that corporate and say, you know what? They helped me out in my walk with God. They helped me with my marriage. They helped me when I was suicidal. They helped me when I was about to lose everything. God used that person to influence my life. That has eternal value. That's why Paul the Apostle said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, while well, we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are unseen are eternal. You want to keep your eyes on that which is seen, the temporary? It's not going to last. Keep your eyes on that which is unseen, the plan of God, the purpose of God. God's, you know, the design for you, your assignment. Stay focused on that and guard your prayer room more than anything else. Because you can read the Bible every single day, but if you're not praying, you're not going to have the strength to obey what you're reading. And you're going to be frustrated. So you're going to end up being a smarter you know, a sinner, but not have the strength to kind of follow through on that. The Bible doesn't, the devil doesn't mind you read and read and read all day. What happens is you start getting knowledge and you get puffed up. Prayer keeps you humble. Every time you go to God, you realize that, wait a minute, he's sovereign over the whole universe. He reminds you that we're just a, a vapor of smoke which appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Like it says in Proverbs, man in his best state is but vapor. Think about that. Man in his best state. They're working out. They're healthy. There's nothing wrong with them. God says, man, in, the, in their best state is but vapor. All they have to do is cause their spirit to leave and they're dead. That's it. So here's your desire. Leprosy, isolated, follow the path of his father and his grandfather, carrying on the same sins of pride. When the king of Israel told that Messiah, stay home, stay home. You don't want to fight. Just because you have a look, stay home. Don't let your pride and your arrogance cause you to be defeated and everyone else. His father allowed his pride to go fight against the king of Israel, and he got defeated. And now his son, after God had blessed him, and he did many wonderful things. And that's the thing, church, that a lot of Christians always talk about how they used to serve God and how you, they used to fast and how they walk with God and how God used to use them. And how it was great in the 90s, you know, the prayer meetings and the casting out demons and all the things they used to do for the Lord. But what are you doing now for God? Doesn't matter how we start. Are we walking with the Lord all the days of our life and say, Lord, I want you to continue to bless me. But the condition is, as long as we seek the Lord, he will cause us to be successful. Then he wasn't even allowed to go into the temple of the Lord, the house of the Lord with leprosy, cast out of the presence of God. Then Jotham, his son, had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. Verse 22, the other events of Uzziah's reign from beginning to end are recorded by the prophet, by the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. Uzziah rested with his fathers and was buried near them in the field for burial that belonged to the kings. But people said he had leprosy. So he wasn't buried in the cemetery of the kings. He had to be buried separated near the cemetery of the kings, but he couldn't be buried in the cemetery of the kings because of his leprosy. And Jonathan, his son, succeeded him as 
king. That's the life of Uzziah. What do we learn today from his story? A powerful man of God. And when you're seeking God, God will raise you up. God will give you more. God will bless you. And you start getting lifted up and God will start, you know, using you in a powerful way and blessings will come from the left and from the right. God will open doors that no man can shut and shut doors that no man can open. If you're seeking God, you will go far with God and you will start walking in your assignment. But if you stop seeking God, the devil whispers in your ear and it tells you, look at how great you are. You're wonderful. The church needs you. Nobody can make it without you. You know, where would people be without you? And he starts feeding all this in your mind. And if you start buying that lie, you're not going to go to the Lord in prayer. So seeking the Lord leads to success. Jesus said this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. The same thing is said in uh, 2 Chronicles. Seek first who the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What are the things he's talking about there? How shall I eat? Why should I drink? How, what should I wear? In other words, how am I going to pay my rent? I need a vehicle. I need this or that. Jesus says, seek me first, and I have a call for you. Seek me first, and I'll pay your rent. That doesn't mean that you don't work or anything. But you seek him first, and he'll take care of you. But your heart has to be seeking him wholeheartedly. It can't be, let me try this to see if it works. You don't try Jesus. You serve him with all your heart. This is not a program that you try for a couple of months. If it doesn't work, then you drop it. You're talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You give your whole heart to him and say, Lord, I'm going to seek you with everything I have. So seeking the Lord leads to success. And the other lesson was pride leads to destruction. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. A Holy Spirit, it starts in your spirit first, inside. You start getting pumped up and inflated and thinking that you're better than everybody else, looking down at other people because they don't have enough money or you drive a better car than them and your house is nice and all that. All of a sudden, you start getting inflated and looking at yourself, and man, I'm better than all these people. Once you start doing that, God has a way of stripping people off those things to rebuild you again. So in conclusion... We see as a rise life, he had a wonderful beginning, but a tragic ending. And this is a warning to us that we be on guard and pray that the Lord would help us to end well. That should be your prayer every single day. Lord, help us end well. A good beginning is no guarantee of a successful ending. I got saved in 1993, and about 30 people in my neighborhood got saved with me. Serving the Lord on fire, prayer meetings here and there, casting out demons. They saw a lot of things. They saw the power of God, manifestations, fasting for three days and all that. Over 30 people, but I can only account maybe for five that are still serving the Lord. It's not how you begin. Everybody gets excited in the beginning of things. It's staying faithful to the Lord. A good beginning is no guarantee of a successful ending, and the sin of an unholy ambition has ruined more than one servant of the Lord. Uzziah the soldier was defeated by his own pride. Uzziah the builder destroyed his own ministry and testimony. And Uzziah the farmer reaped the painful harvest of what he has sown. He is a warning to all who are, he is a warning to all who Nurture unholy ambition to intrude into that which God has not appointed for them. Stay doing what God has called you to do. Stay faithful to the word of God. Even if people around you are being disobedient and they don't want to follow the Lord, you stay faithful to God. God's going to hold each one of us accountable. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it is destined for a person to die once and after that, face judgment. We all are going there, some sooner and later, but it's destined for a person to die once. And after that, you got to face Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and face judgment for the life you lived here on earth. And you can't say, well, nobody else was being faithful to the Lord, so I decided to go their route. We're all going to be judged individually. We're all going to stand before God, even though no one else wants to serve the Lord. You know, and you meet other Christians that compromise and sell out and are giving in to all this woke movement and all this LGTB. You stay faithful to the word of God. And guess what? 
You will be blessed when God removes his blessing off of other people. It says in the Bible, do not follow the crowd in doing evil. And bad company corrupts good character. Why don't we stand as we get ready to close? I'm going to ask Pastor Wayne to close us in a powerful word of prayer. And that we would learn this lesson from King Uzziah that started off well, that started off seeking God, and God caused him to be successful. And at the end of his life, he got prideful, and it became his downfall. Let us learn from Uzziah's life. Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your presence. Lord, we receive that word today, Lord. Help us, Lord, to not grow proud, my Lord. To be full of pride, my Lord, in doing what is right, Lord, or taking advantage of the blessings of the Lord, Father. Help us, Lord, to remain humble, my Lord, Father, so that we may be lifted up, my Lord, my God. Help us, Lord, to continue, Lord, to go to our prayer room, Lord, to go away, my Lord, from the crowd, my Lord, away from the world, Lord, away from the chaos, Lord, yes. away from our circumstance, our situation, away from work, away from the children, away from everything and everyone, Lord, to connect with you, Lord, Father, for we know, Lord, that our prayer life with you, Lord, is our lifeline, my Lord, as believers, Lord. Help us, Lord, to grab a hold of you, Lord, during prayer, Lord. Help us, Lord, to continue to seek you, Lord, through our fasting, Lord. Help us, my Lord, my God, to maintain focus, Lord, on the kingdom of God and all of your righteousness, Lord, so that you can, my Lord, provide all of our needs, my Lord. Help us, Lord, to lean not on our own understanding, Lord, but to acknowledge you, Lord God, in all of our ways, in everything we do, Lord, so that you may direct our path. Help us to be imitators of Christ. Help us to be God-pleasers, Lord, not people-pleasers. Help us to only worry about what our Heavenly Father thinks about what our Heavenly Father has called us to do and who our Heavenly Father has called us to be, Lord. And I thank you for the grace of God. I thank you for the mercy of God, Lord, that is poured out upon us, Lord, each and every day, multiple times a day at times, my Lord, my God. Thank you for the love, Lord. You love us like no other, my Lord. You loved us before the foundations of this world, my Lord. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Thank you, Lord, for we are also your friends. And we just ask you, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, to continue, Lord, tugging on our hearts, my Lord, my God. Continue, Lord, to give us a heart, Lord, of flesh, Lord, a heart that can be molded, my Lord, a heart that can receive correction, Lord, a heart that is willing to be led, my Lord, a heart that is willing to be sold out for the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. Help us to be more like you, God. We just ask that you have your way in each and every one of our lives, Lord. Continue, Lord. Continue doing what you are doing, Lord. Touching the hearts of men, Lord, so that we can be changed, Lord. Father, and I just thank you and I pray, Lord, that you guide each and every one of us. Encourage each and every one of us throughout this week, my Lord. Father, I pray that we are encouraged, Lord. First thing in the morning before we leave our homes, Lord, to connect with God. I pray, Lord, that we, my Lord, we don't leave that home, Lord. We don't, my Lord, go about our day until we have first, my Lord, met with our Heavenly Father, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Father, and I ask you in the name of Jesus, Lord, to even bring correction throughout this week, throughout our walk, Lord. And we just thank you for that correction. For we know, my Lord, the ones you love, Lord, like any loving Father, Lord, not only do you bring blessings, Lord, but you also bring correction. And we thank you and we receive it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If anybody want to receive prayer, me and